2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we're going to be today as we talk about being ready for life. And our subject today is these bodies are jars of clay. Life comes at you. It comes at you from the craziest places. And even the people that you feel so close to and the people that you feel that you can count on will sometimes turn on you. My mentor and my spiritual hero, Pastor Gregory, who's gone on to be with the Lord, one time when I was just new at Faith Baptist as the student pastor, we had this sort of uh, just a simple event that we were going to go out and a bonfire and I was going to preach there at the bonfire. And for some reason, it just kind of got larger and larger. And we were preparing for about 20, 30 students. And the next thing you know, more kids started showing up and showing up and showing up. And at that time at Faith, we had five vans that we used, which were great because anybody could drive them. And so as kids started showing up, I had two vans ready. Well, I grabbed another van and more kids showed up where I grabbed and pulled up another van, gave a key to an adult and said, hey, drive this. And eventually I got down to the fifth van, that gray Ford van that I was told at the beginning, you're not allowed to use because that is the senior citizen van. It had the best air conditioning and it also had the cloth seats and the senior citizens liked that van. And that was the senior citizen van, Steve, and we don't use that. Well, kids started showing up and I started doing the math. So I just went and grabbed the key and I pulled the van up. Well, that Friday night, Pastor Gregory, for some reason, was working late. And the next thing I know, after I pulled that out, out came this old man of God, but he came out with a red face and he was upset and he got up in my face and said, Steve, that van is for the seniors. You are told not to use it. What are you doing using that van? And I calmly said, OK, Pastor, we won't use it. But I kind of grabbed him by the shoulders and gently turned him around to this huge crowd of teenagers. And I said, you just tell me which kids have to go home. You point them out and I'll tell them to leave. And he looked at me and got a smile on his face. And he called me like he would do every time I was in trouble. He called me Stephen. There's only a few people that are allowed to call me Stephen. And he is the only male in that group. And he smiled at me and said, OK, use the van. And I told him when, the next day, I said, you know, a couple kids got saved that day and stuff. And to his credit, he said, that's great. I'm glad that you used it. So sometimes you can be doing the right thing and feeling like everything's going well. And somebody comes out of their office with a red face yelling at you. Life can be flipped over. If you're taking notes today, our one simple true thought is this. Life will shake you. Life will shake you. You think you have life figured out. You think you've got it all taken care of. And like a kid losing the game, life will take the board and flip it up on side of you. And all the pieces go scattered and everything you had planned is completely ruined. But in the middle of all this chaos is us human beings. And we are these fragile things. Think about this. Think about how much maintenance the human body requires. I'm so glad I'm not a girl. So glad I'm not a female because that maintenance is beyond me. All right. I'm glad that I can choose whether or not to shave or not. Anyways, if the human body was a car, you'd never buy it. If you bought a car and they told you how much maintenance would you be? Like, oh, my Lord. Let me go buy an American car. Anyways, Paul calls us this human body in verse seven. He calls us jars of clay. The, look at what the King James says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that's jars of clay, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. These pots that he's talking, the King James calls them earthen. They were made of dirt. They were, they were cheap and simple, just like the human body. This human body is made of dirt, isn't it? And that when we die, this body goes back to the grave. But these human bodies, excuse me, these jars of clay were also used to store great treasures. People would take these jars of clay and because they were simple and unassuming, they would hide their greatest treasure inside them. And people would hide gold. If you know your history, these jars of clay that Paul are talking about are the jars of clay that the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden in. Because those scribes thought the word of God was such a treasure, they put it inside these jars of clay. So even though our bodies are simple, frail jars, jars of clay made from the dirt, inside them is a treasure. If you're just taking notes, this isn't my thought, but I thought it was pretty good. The contents in the pot are more valuable than the pot. What they are putting inside these jars is more valuable 
than what the pots are. Paul says that our bodies are frail jars of dirt, but inside them there is something special. Look at verse 6 to see what that treasure is, that light. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that shined in our hearts. By the way, you're not that light. To give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Inside these frail bodies is a light. It's not a light inside you that sort of builds up and by your own merit and your own ability becomes greater. No, that's not the light. The light inside you is the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. As jars of clay, two thoughts. As jars of clay, humans are strong enough to hold the greatest treasure. We may be frail. We may be weak. Your body may give out this week. You may have to have surgery on it. You may wear it out. Allergies to COVID, to anything else may in fact, in fact, infect you. But here's the thing. Your frail body is still strong enough to hold the greatest treasure in the universe, and that's Jesus Christ. And the only way to know Jesus, and every now and then I feel like I need to say this as our voice gets transmitted over the internet or over uh, the radio, the only way to know Christ as your personal Savior is by recognizing that you are a sinner separated from God and that God loved you so much He sent Jesus to die on a cruel cross for you and you accept that free gift in childlike faith and ask Christ to be your Savior. Paul says it, call upon the name of the Lord in Romans. However terminology you want to use, the only way you're going to heaven is unless you are born again, saved. But also these jars of clay of human are indwelled by the greatest spirit. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That verse I put there, Romans 8, 9, is the second part of it. Now, if any man have not the spirit of God, he has none of his. There is no such things as Christians who do not have the Holy Spirit of God. When you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit indwelled you. That jar of clay, you are struggling with it. You're struggling with it. You're struggling with doctor's appointments. You feel like your body is a fixer-upper that is deteriorating and falling in. And if you were a house, you feel like the city would condemn you. But inside that jar of clay, if you know Christ, is the Holy Spirit of God. Paul was a battered old, clot, battered old clay pot, but look what he was able to endure. That, that fragile pot endured this. Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Paul gives a contrast of the Christian life in those verses. Paul will say this, the contrast, if you're taking notes. Paul first, Paul was under pressure, but did not break. Verse 8 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. The word troubled there in the King James literally means under pressure. The word distressed or crushed in other translations means to be confined to a small space. What Paul is literally describing is a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker brought into a small space, and eventually that pressure cooker is going to blow, isn't it? I'm reminded of this uh, little joke <clears throat> of a single mom. This single mom with so many struggles and problems had five children she was tr attempting to raise on her own. She came home after going to the grocery store and leaving the five there, and she came home to find the five of her children sort of huddled in a little circle in the living room floor thinking, well, what could have their occupation? What could occupy their attention so well? This single mom walked up to, to horror to see all five of her little kids in a circle all playing with five little skunks. The mom, in her horror, yelled, Quick, children, run! Only to have all five of her kids pick up a skunk and run. Life makes you feel like you're going to break. That God has put so much on you that you could never bear this. Paul says we are under pressure. The walls are closing in. But we're not going to break. Number two, Paul was at a loss but not lost. In verse eight, ye are not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair. I'm not sure the whys and what is going to happen in my life. I'm not sure what the future is going to be. 
I'm not even sure why God has chosen this, but I know who knows. Number three, he was hunted, but not alone. Verse nine, persecuted, but not forsaken. The word Paul uses for persecuted is a word for hunting an animal, like a fox hunt. Death is stalking you. I don't know if you know this or not. I don't hope to be. The, I don't want to be the person that breaks this to you, but I don't know if you know that one day you're going to die. I've seen the statistics. Ten out of ten people, they die. You may be able to push it back. You may be able to have better health care. You may be able to work out and everything else. But eventually, death is going to win for all of us. Death is stalking you. You are hunted by it. But in that process of it catching you and finally will catch you one day, you are never alone. You may be in a jail cell all alone. You may be in solitary confinement, but if you know Jesus, he's there. You may be in a hospital bed and the doctors and hospitals may not even let your family come find you because of COVID. But even though you are alone, if you know Christ, you have him there. There is no place on this planet that somebody can separate you from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus. Hunted like an animal, but never alone. Amen. Number four, <clears throat> we are, Paul was wrestled, but not pinned. He says this in verse nine, cast down, but not destroyed. I like this as a kid from the 80s and a little bit of the 90s. I liked wrestling. And that's literally the word Paul is using here. So see, mom, it wasn't bad for me to watch wrestling. The Apostle Paul agreed with it. He uses the word cast down, and it literally means to be thrown down violently. It is the terminology that they would use in wrestling. Paul is using the image of a small little man going up against a much larger professional man who knows what he's doing and having that larger man take this little man and throw him down and throw him all around. But the Apostle Paul, much like the rock, does not give up and simply says, just bring it. Thank you, Andy, for getting that. Paul takes all of this in stride because he has Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks a lot about death. He talks about it a lot. In the next first three verses, he mentions it quite often. But he reminds us after that of talking about death, he reminds us of two perspectives that changed. Look at verse 14. Remember, he just... Skip, I've skipped over some verses. He talked about death. We're going to go to verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. The first perspective that Paul had is that if God can raise Jesus, he has us covered. If, listen, if God can, you need to say amen to that. If God can raise Jesus, he has us covered. Amen. That's why the resurrection is so important. It is what separates Jesus from just a prophet and a great teacher. It declares his deity. That's why the resurrection is so important, because it is our only source of hope that Jesus rose from the grave, and someday so will we and all that we love that know him. And by the way, that's why it's under attack. Second perspective Paul gets is in verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The perspective that Paul has is that what life throws at us is just for a short period of time. James, Jesus' half-brother, will say in James 4.17 that life is nothing more than a vapor. Other translations take that word vapor and they call it a soap bubble. A soap bubble appears for a moment and it looks beautiful, but eventually, no matter what, that soap bubble pops. And that's exactly what life was. Ask Paul, though, now, when you get to heaven, ask him, was everything that you went through? The Apostle Paul was stoned to death and his friends left him. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked and had to spend many days inside the, the, the center of some of the worst jails in the world. He was beaten and whipped for everything because of Jesus. And you go and ask Paul now as he sits at the feet of Jesus Christ in heaven, hey, Paul, was it worth it what you went through? I think of a, a story, and I keep a little note inside my Bible of this story. I, I remember hearing it, and it's a, a man by the name of Thomas Hawk. Thomas Hawk's 
uh, was a believer in Jesus Christ in the 1500s in England. And he was uh, charged with and sentenced to death for the audacity of reading God's word and preaching that Jesus was the only way to heaven. And he and a group of other believers were in a jail cell and they were going to be killed the next day. Thomas Hawk would be killed that day and the rest of the believers would be killed the next day. One of the men said to him before he was going to be killed, he said, I have to know as they burn you at the stake, is Jesus great enough to endure the flames? Would you give me some signal, Thomas? And Thomas Hawk, when they took him and they tied him to the, the stake and they lit him on fire with all the fire around him, eventually the fire burned away the ropes holding his hand. And as a testimony to Jesus that he is great enough, with his hands on fire as he was dying, he raised him up and clapped his hands three times to say that Jesus was greater than the fire. The word that Paul uses there in verse 17, he uses the phrase, the weight of glory. It is a reference to a meat market. It is a reference to a market of going to a butcher and, and him putting the, wheat, the meat on the scale and then telling you how much you owed. What Paul is saying by saying the weight of glory, he's basically saying this, that God has tipped the scales in your favor. That no matter what you have and what you're going through, God has put his thumb on the scale and he is going to make sure you get through it. The rewards in heaven outweigh the suffering on earth. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen. You know, an immature person goes by sight. Um, I work with a lot of 20-year-old guys. And uh, 20-year-old guys are about as mature as 14-year-old uh, guys when I was in high school. Uh, we are not maturing men. We are postponing maturity and prolonging adolescence. And to the point where there's some 40-year-olds who act like they're 14. And uh, there's a lot of people and there's a lot of 20-something-year-old uh, year old girls there too. Well, I don't know if you notice about this or not, but 20-something-year-old boys tend to notice 20-something-year-old girls. Uh, I don't know if you knew that or not, but they do. And I talk with some of them and uh, a lot of them will talk, oh, and they, the thing they mention about these girls are their looks. And I said this to one of them. I said, well, yes, yeah, she is pretty. But what's she like on the inside? And he was kind of thought that was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. <laughs> and I said this to him. I said, look, I, marry somebody who will change your diaper when you get old. Marry somebody who doesn't just look pretty now, but marry somebody whose character will last forever. Because beauty really is just skin deep, isn't it? You can take the most handsome man or woman in the world, but you take the skin off and they're gross, aren't they? You see, immature people are sight orientated like a young man. A mature man looks for something deeper than just this outward appearance. Paul says, look for something beyond the physical. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen, what are they? He uses the word temporal or temporary. It means destined to perish. You know what human beings are like? And I wanted to use this as an illustration, and I thought about using what you just gave me, but I don't want to waste it. Human beings are like a can of Coke. Really? They are. Because when you take a can of Coke, which is better than Pepsi, by the way, if you're drinking Pepsi, you need to repent. Get right with God. Anyways. <laughs> but when you open a can of Coke and you do it, what does it do? It's just like a human being. It goes psh. Human beings, when they enter this world, make a lot of noise, don't they? Babies are loud. They're gross. They're disgusting. I don't know why we keep having them. Anyways, babies are loud. And we enter the life just like a can of Coke and we go psh. And there's a lot of fizz and potential. But eventually what happens to that can of Coke? It goes stale. You can pop it open and you can come back an hour later and eh, you can come back a day later. And you're like, what in the world is this? It was sugar water. That's what you were drinking. 
it's the best sugar water on the planet, but that's all it is. And the human body and the human life is just like a can of Coke. You pop it open and psh, it starts off with a big bang and it's kind of fun and it tastes well and the bubbles hit your nose and you pour it on uh, ice and everything and it, oh, it's just so great and refreshing. But eventually the ice melts, eventually the can, the, the Coke goes stale and eventually there's nothing of value left, isn't it? And some of you are feeling pretty stale right now, aren't you? This world is just like that. It starts off with a bang. Hey, look, beer, I got asked, it's been the first time in a long time, I got asked to go to a bar this week. And uh, one of their, a whole group of our class that had passed, they were meeting at this bar. And one of the guys who I'd been friends with, and, and he came up, he said, hey, Steve, why don't you come with us to the bar? And I said, you know what, that's just not my scene. And I said, I'm a Baptist preacher, and I just don't go to bars and stuff. And he said, well, that's who needs you the most. And I, I, I thought, well, that's true, that's true and stuff. But I, I decided I'm not going to a bar. Uh, but anyways, I digress. So I didn't go, Ma. There you go, I didn't go. But uh, only to start a church. Yeah, I, I did tell him that. It's temporary, but you know what? That's what the, the joys of life are. You go to a bar and you can get drunk. And it's just like a can of Coke. Psh. All right, it solves your problem for a while. You take heroin. Psh. It solves your problem for a while. Whatever your drug, whatever the crutch you're leaning on, whether it be materialism or a relationship or a person, psh. it solves your problem for a while, but eventually it goes stale. Paul says, but the things that are not seen are eternal. You know what's eternal? The Trinity. God. God is eternal. And there's one other thing that's eternal. You know, Satan's not eternal. He'd get thrown into the lake of fire. He is not eternal. There's only one other thing that is eternal. You. You're an eternal being. You may be wrapped in this outer jar of clay, but you're an eternal being who's either going to spend eternity with God or without God. The things that are eternal last. So, three things. I had a good week, so you're going to get three. <laughs> Fragile jars of clay should do three things. Number one. They should value spiritual strength. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Do you know what the strongest material on earth is? It's not a diamond. The strongest material on earth is a thing called graphene. Uh, it was sort of discovered back in 2010. They're anticipating it to change the entire face of the world and everything that we do. If they can mass produce it, they think it'll change everything in the world. It is a very thin layer of graphite, basically, and it's a million times stronger than steel. In fact, that thin layer of graphite can stop a bullet. It's just a very thin hexagon shaped of carbon put together. In fact, you can create it by taking some tape and getting some graphite, a, a slab, and just with scotch tape, and you can start to make it. In fact, that's one of the ways it was discovered by doing it. It's a very thin, unassuming thing, and yet it will stop a bullet. I thought of that. That's a lot like Jesus. On the surface, when you see it, you wouldn't think much of graphene, but it's pretty strong. On the surface, the world doesn't think much of Jesus of going to church, of being here. But he can stop a bullet, can he? What makes us strong, let's be very clear. I want to be straightforward so there's no misunderstanding. What makes us strong is Jesus. And quite frankly, that's when Andy and I talked about Cross Creek Church. That's why our byline is just simply Jesus. Because in the end, denominations don't last. In the end, creeds aren't even biblical. In the end, it's just Jesus. Right. Value spiritual strength. Number two, value the future over the past, over the present. Uh, when I was a work security in uh, Walmart in Illinois, we would stop people for shoplifting. And it is amazing. Every person, whether they were a teenage girl, by the way, the number one thief of Walmart, is a Walmart employee. Number two thief are teenage girls who steal makeup. Mm. So it is amazing from a teenage girl to an older senior citizen, an old lady we caught, to moms with babies. That was fun. Uh, they all say the same thing. Once you catch them and bring them into that room and say you have something on you, they all say the same thing. Well, I'll just pay for it now. 
Well, wait a second. So what you're telling me is you walked into the store with enough money to buy what you were stealing, right? If you can pay for it now, you obviously had the money to pay for what you were stealing. You just thought you could get away from it for it. What these people do is no different than most of us. They just live in the present, not the future. You could pay for it. You could pay, realize what you need, but you would rather steal it and take the cheap, easy way out instead of the difficult task of the future. Our future is with Jesus. Amen? Amen. What's going to finally make you give up? Look, it's too late when you die to go, oh, no, now I'll accept Jesus. Oh, it's too late. But no, it's also too late when you're struggling, to, when you give up. They, well, I, I want a do-over, God. There aren't always do-overs in life. Sometimes you have to deal with the decisions you've made. Value the future over the present. And lastly, number two, number three, fragile jars of clay should value the eternal over the temporal. Uh, demons are real. They are flat out real. Uh, they are not dead people. They are fallen angels, a third of the angels that Satan was convinced to go with him. Demons are real. Don't go chasing demons and being an exorcist and casting them out. Don't. It's, you have, you've never been called to do that. It's not your job. You've not been called to chase out demons. You've been called to pursue and follow Jesus. It's a big difference. Uh, listen, Satan is not as strong as a little girl who turns to Jesus. When you turn to Jesus, you are turning your back on Satan and he will run and fear. Go to Jesus. Don't fight the devil. Amen? Amen. But demons are real. Don't chase them. But can I also say to you, don't be afraid of them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The great philosopher Socrates, Socrates, it's a, a joke from the 80s. Socrates said, and he did, he had a demon. Now, because he was educated, he, they, he called him a demon. Uh, it's basically a demon. It's a spirit guide, he said. And he was faced with the decision. People were telling him to get out because there were a group of people that wanted to kill him. And this demon that he listened to said, stay there. And what ended up happening, uh, he ended up being killed. And the demon got him killed. One of the most demonic tricks that a demon will do, it's not like the movies making a head spin and vomit pea soup. That's not the demonic tricks that they do. Here's the biggest demonic trick that a demon will do in your life. He will tell you that today is all that matters. That's it. Today's all that matters and stay here. And like Socrates, Socrates, we buy the lie and it ends up killing us. Paul was a future thinker. And whatever we can endure, whatever we can go in through, we can endure it because our future is with Jesus. The Bible tells us a little bit about heaven. It tells us more about hell than heaven. It only tells us a little bit about a heaven. It gives us ideas of streets of gold and the new Jerusalem it might be like and speculations of everything that could happen and what that's going to be like and what we will do. I don't think it's going to be harps and clouds at all. But it only gives us really the most important thing of heaven. Heaven is wherever Jesus is. I know... I know heaven's not Ohio because there's no way Jesus would go there. But heaven is wherever Jesus is. And whatever we're facing today, whatever this jar of clay has to go through, we can endure it because our future is with him. I want to close with this little story. Uh, a friend of mine posted it online and I remembered it because... Uh, Pastor Gregory was the first one who told it, or the first one I heard tell it. And every time I hear this story, I always think about him. So I just want to read it to you, what they've posted. And one of the leaders of the great prayer revival of 1858 in Philadelphia was a pastor by the name of Dudley Tin. More than 10,000 people were saved over the course of the meetings that were held. One day, Tin went out to watch a demonstration of a new threshing machine. It's not known how, but somehow his coat became entangled in the machine and he was severely injured. 
By the time a doctor could be summoned, there was nothing that could be due to save his life. In fact, his right arm was caught and mangled inside that machine. From his deathbed, Tin sent a message to a pastor friend by the name of George Duffield, who was going to preach his funeral. He told him this in his dying words, tell them to stand up for Jesus. Not long afterward, Dudfield wrote a poem based on his friend's final words, and we still sing it today. Those words from a dying man of God were, stand up, stand up for Jesus. His friend would on, go on to expand it to, ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. And to pay deeper tribute to his friend, it is that second stanza that he mentions it in referencing to his friend losing his arm in that threshing and being mangled and dying from that accident. He says that phrase, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your arm. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, but never wanting there. It's a great story and a great song. And it reminds us that this jar of clay will one day be destroyed and one day will be turned back to the earth. But your soul will live forever. And in the meantime, what God is calling you to do, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Join me in prayer.